you're tuned in to the Data Masters Podcast. In each episode, we dissect the complexities of data management and discuss the data strategies that fuel innovation, growth, and efficiency. We speak with industry leaders who share how their modern approaches to data management help their organizations succeed. Let's dive straight into today's episode with Anthony Dayton. Welcome to Data Masters. I'm joined today by Tom Andriola, who's Vice Chancellor of Information Technology and Data and Chief Digital Officer for the University of California at Irvine. He's a thought leader on how to use technology and data as a tool to innovate, invent, and disrupt. He spends his days working with the uh, organizations at UCI to create data as a strategy initiatives and implement those strategies and enhance the new value propositions and manage the change that comes with those efforts. Uh, welcome to Data Masters, Tom. Anthony, thank you. Glad to be here today. So when I was thinking about uh, this conversation and this podcast, uh, I'll be a little honest, I struggled um, because you have a very wide mandate uh, in your role as a chief digital officer because you operate at the intersection of two seemingly very different institutions, both under the University of California, Irvine. Obviously, the one I think most people think of when I say UCI is the you know, world-class academic institution. Uh, but there's also a significant healthcare provider under that umbrella as well. So maybe to start, just to give a little context for folks, uh, maybe talk a little bit about your roles and responsibilities, but also how that works across those two very different organizations. Yeah, thank you for the question, because it is a unique role. You really won't find one like it, and you, you'll find things close to it, but it is kind of custom designed, and it came out of a, an assessment that was done several years ago. And actually had a hand in kind of writing the job description as a vision for really where the, where the world was going and the leadership here at the time having kind of a singular view of what they wanted UC Irvine to be. So in terms of, you know, let, let's talk about uh, some of the things you just mentioned, right? So it is across two industry sectors uh, that work very different, that have differences, but also similarities. Uh, and so healthcare. It's really a, a for pro for the most part a for profit or you know really kind of a a bottom line driven you know type of organizational approach, where an educational institution is you know let's say more of a not for profit institutional mentality. Uh, so there's differences there. There's certain differences in the speed and and kind of um, a velocity in which things are moving. Universities shut down for periods of time when students go home, right, or there are breaks. Hospitals, ERs stay open 24-7, 365, right? So you have those differences. But let's also talk about some of the similarities. They both have this aspect of a very strong subject matter expert whose knowledge and experience is key to the value proposition. In one place, we call it the clinician or doctor. The other place, we call it the professor or instructor. And they're key to delivering on the mission of the organization. And then you have kind of student and patient have some similarities that they're heavily reliant on that subject matter expertise and the scaffolding around them. Another key similarity, and this leads kind of to your question about the role, is they're both um, information and knowledge-centric industries, even though they don't mean us think of themselves as they. If you think about what happens in an instructional environment or a research environment, it's driven around data to information to knowledge. Um, and so when you think about healthcare, it's all about understanding through data, the patient. And so the concept of, um, we're using more technology just generally in our society and how organizations work. Technology is really for me, a data generation engine. It's really what technology is. It basically takes something that we used to do like through analog, like you and I sitting in a room, listening to each other talk, and now turns it into this digital data stream that we can capture and review the transcript word for word. Uh, and we can look at these, you know, the images of you and I looking at each other through a computer vision analysis, and it turns it into something digital that now makes it computable. Well, both industries are going through that transformation. And so the concept was understand where technology is taking both industries, understand where the data was gonna become critical from the standpoint of traditional analytics, 
And then how do you build data foundations underneath that? Because the future of AI really is predicated around having good data foundations so you can do something meaningful with the data through the use of these, you know, current and new tools that are coming out. And so they basically said, you know, we need someone who thinks at that level, who's thinking about not just today, but what's, what are we going to look like as an institution that is educating students or caring for patients five years from now and laying out those those strategies and frameworks for us and finding synergy across so we're not duplicating everything. And so that's kind of how the role evolved and how I spend my time at the end of the day is really saying, where's technology taking us? What kind of data is it generating? What do we want to do with the data? How do we bring it together? Because, you know, data silos exist in every organization and we're no different. And then how do we start to think about analytics, structured data, unstructured data? What are we doing with generative AI tools? How does computer vision play into a multimodal approach to thinking about analytics? So, you know, if someone's not thinking about that or someone's only thinking about it five or 10% of their time, progress is slow. But if someone has that as the core responsibility, then conversations get started quicker and ultimately we get the strategies. Yeah, and I, I really want to get to talking about the data, given this is Data Masters. Uh, but I also, I want to start a little bit more around almost the business of, uh, of your business. Uh, and again, uh, acknowledging that an academic institution, uh, is less of a, uh, for-profit business, but thinking about the strategies of both organizations and your role. And as, as we talked about in the introduction is really tasked with predicting the future and thinking a bit about the future. Uh, but not really about what's going to happen next month or even, I would think, uh, next year, but really what's coming, you know, five or even 10 years out, how the world's going to change um, and how our relationship with data is going to be affected by that change and how we will affect our, you know, our, the data, we, to your point, the data we'll generate. So I thought I might share some somewhat controversial, maybe points of view or ideas uh, and get your view on them, given your role. So maybe to start, um, there's a lot of conversation today about the value of a four-year college degree. I think it's still today largely recognized as something very, very valuable. There's wage gaps between those with a college degree and those without. Um, but I'm curious on your point of view uh, on that uh, value. Uh, is it possible that the four-year degree's value will be diminished as more and more knowledge and information comes online, more and more of it's available for free through streaming platforms, uh, and potentially that puts pressure on this wage differential between those with a college degree and those without, um, where either those without a college degree have the same knowledge and information as those with, uh, or employers start recognizing that there may be less value there uh, and they're not willing to pay as much. But I'm curious on how you think about that and how the school's thinking about that. Yeah, so I think you know, I would use the word, these types of changes are inevitable and they're already on the way. And, and I like to start here with something that we maybe don't think about is why did we used to go to live and go to school at the campus? It's because that's where the knowledge was. You know, in a time before the internet, if you wanted access to advanced knowledge around thermodynamics, because you wanted to be an engineer, you had to go to campus. You had to sit in the classroom. Well, after the internet came along and it really democratized access to at least information, then all of a sudden you could get access to that information through different mechanisms. Maybe one led to you getting a piece of paper that said you passed a set of requirements and you were converted a degree, but you could also get access to that in an informal way and have access to that knowledge and maybe master it better than the person who sat through the four years of class. So that was already starting to change. And of course, then technology caught up and said, now we have different modes of how you can consume that knowledge. You can sit in a classroom and you can do it online. Uh, you can be self-paced or you could be you know, uh, delivered through a traditional quarter or, or semester based system. So these changes have already started to go. And of course, within the establishment, you have this argument over, is the educational process better? Is the ped these pedagogy of teaching better? Are the outcomes better if someone who learns sitting in the classroom for 15 weeks versus doing a self-paced online course that they meet to complete an eight? And that's been the debate inside. But we're now moving to a new era with AI. 
which is AI gives us the dilemma of can AI as that deep subject matter expert, if I can build a someone who can deliver me the content, you know, a tool that can deliver me the content and spar with me in a one-to-one -one way, in a way that I could never do in a classroom where I have to sit with 75 other students. And if I can quote unquote, pass the test, meet the requirements to get what would be an A and master that, what does that mean to be able to say, quote unquote, I'm an educated person able to do job X. The other thing that's happening is this concept of an unbundle. The traditional system basically says, you know, you have to do all these things and you get the degree credential that is recognized by employers. If you do all but two classes, right? So I have to, you know, I have to take, what is it? 40 classes. I did 38. It's binary. It's zero or one. Well, if you start to unpack that into things called like competencies and skill-based learning, then all of a sudden I can get credit from 38 out of 40 because I can represent that I've mastered certain things. And in the employment world, competencies and skills are what people hire for, especially earlier in the career. And so these are the unpacking things that other institutions are starting to offer that quite honestly, more and more institutions are saying, we need to follow this trend. The third trend I would say is the, just the acceleration, which is people, and this is, especially we're seeing this in master's programs, people can't afford to take the two years off or the 18 month part-time giving up two weekends a month to get that. They are really, what they're looking for is I need short, concise, and I don't care if it's intense, learning of something that helps me get the next career step. So we have to offer packaging in a way that's different to meet the velocity at which the world and specifically the business world is changing. So the question then comes back to, so what does an institution that's been very successful in the old model do in a world that is moving away from them very, very fast? And you start to see this with kind of the smaller liberal arts schools first. They're the ones that are impacted. You see closures going on and financial stress. You know, institutions like ours right now aren't very impacted because we live in a state where the population is still growing. Uh, we have high reputation, you know, and also a research mission that kind of makes us a more attractive university. But we're trying to stay ahead of these changes. And, you know, for example, you know, more than 20% of our undergraduate, uh, our, um, our, uh, lower level undergraduate courses now are offered in an online format. They could take it in person or they can take it online. And so that optionality is what more and more learners are looking for, whether they're traditional learners, non-traditional learners or adult learners. And so we're trying to meet at the optionality level first, and then we'll move into different alternative credential models that essentially meet the need that people are looking for today. So, so I love this idea that um, as uh, knowledge becomes more readily available, more digitized, uh, it's therefore easier for people to access. To your point, you can now access it through other media besides uh, the in-person experience. I'm sure the COVID experience accelerated all of that. Um, but it, And a little to your point, it also means that now that knowledge is available to, um, to models. Uh, to AI. Um, and I think this relates uh, to maybe the other side of your business, uh, to the physician side and patient care and, deli and, and healthcare delivery. Um, I have a lot of friends who are doctors. They often complain about patients who use Dr. Google. You know, they'll come in and say, well, I Googled these symptoms and I think I have, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and, you know, they're what they're really saying there is, look, I have a specialized body of knowledge. Yes, Google is useful for, for you know, looking up a few facts, uh, but you need me as the physician to sort of filter those facts through my experience and my knowledge uh, to give you an answer. But to the extent that AI has been trained on all of the available medical literature, every single uh, you know, piece of uh, literature that's ever been written, it could be the case that at least in the five to 10 year time frame, we have um, models which are better than, I was going to say as good as, but let's say better than the human doctor at uh, doing some of this diagnostic work. Maybe maybe they don't have quite a good a bedside manner. But uh, but anyway, so I'm curious from your perspective, thinking about, you know, as you train the next generation of uh, graduates um, and then they think about going and working uh, at the healthcare provider, you know, 
Do you, is that fair? Is that, or am I overstating where the way you see this going? Uh, you're not overstating at all. The question is how fast, and and then every organization has to decide where you're going to be on this adoption curve. You know, towards you know a you know a, a new normal. So let me put on a couple of things. Did you have a lot of doctors' friends? Next time you have dinner with them, ask them if they ever heard this question in their first year of medical school, because most have. And I didn't go to medical school, but like you, I have a lot of doctor friends having worked in the industry. And in their first year, they usually hear a statement that sounds like this. 50% of what you're going to learn in medical school is wrong. We just don't know what 50%. Now, that's a skip thought as a patient, right? But, there, but there's a message in there, which is, look, you, we're going to give you a basis of education. But as our understanding of human biologies, our understanding of how our environment and our decisions impact our health, our understanding is going to change. And so you have to commit to constantly kind of reading and experimenting and relearning a better way, right? If you think about genetics 30 years ago, what we knew and what we know today, if you haven't kept up with understanding how ge- our understanding and unpacking genetics drive certain disease categories, then you're behind the times and you're not doing right by your patients, right? But already medicine you know, and medical care is known that it is a knowledge-based game and it's a moving target, right? And so then the, so then the question is, is how do you say that stay up to speed? When you start to put all this other knowledge out there, um, you start to change. And this is what some doctors, you know, um, you know, kind of really bristle at. Others are starting to become more acceptance of what we're training doctors to be more acceptance of is the patient who walks in with their own level of research. It means they're taking a, a level of agency of their own situation. And that shouldn't be a bad thing. It should be, you know, a complementary thing to create the right type of conversation between medical professional and and uh, patient. I'm actually part of a startup that uh, that basically is saying, look, I'm big into the wearable myself. I believe actually, you know, what can my doctor tell about me once a year coming into their office into a very controlled environment and doing a set a battery of tests that are a single point in time versus what wearables can tell me what happens over 365 days. I was just telling some colleagues this morning, I have sleep stage data for the last four years of my life every day. Good sleep, bad sleep, days I took naps, days I didn't get enough deep sleep. Isn't that more indicative of my true health nature um, than a doctor saying, so how do you sleep? You ever have problems sleeping? What do they literally learn by that versus, hey, I'm going to give you four years worth of data. The reality is, is most doctors today didn't get a foundation in statistics to understand what do I do with that? So one of the companies I'm helping launch is helping doctors understand what to do with that data and it integrate it into their thought process for how they see their patients. So I think that's the other thing is it's healthcare is realizing it's a data-driven industry. It's looking to AI to figure out how do I deal with the massive amounts of information that we actually have around the patients that we generate, that patients can generate for themselves and now bring to the equation. And how do we start to actually get different types of insights, maybe better insights through that to complement the things we might ask them in a traditional visit or in a traditional, you know, kind of uh, stay that they may end up in the hospital. So it's a changing world. The question is, is how do you then move back into the medical students who are starting this fall, right? They're not going to start practicing. They'll start, you know, they'll start riding shotgun by their third year. They won't really start in their own practice until at least year five of their training. And of course, not you know, after their residency, they're really in practice. It's a long horizon. If we try to shoot for where things are, how far off are we going to be just in what we've seen in the last 18 months since the introduction of chat GPT? This is what makes it really challenging. It's like you have to continue to think about where's the puck going to be. And the longer that time frame, the harder it is to figure out the target you shoot for. Yeah, that is a, and very much to that point, so the patients are coming into these doctor relationships with a lot more data and information, not whether, to your point about your, your sleep experience, it could be tracking your uh, exercise, it could be tracking, I, you know, I have a digital scale, so I have weight wet measurements going back years. That, and again, like, but to your point, the doctor asks, well, what do you weigh? You know, that's what I weigh today. Like, doesn't tell, has your weight changed? Like, you know, it's my memory. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, but also students are walking into the classroom with a lot more knowledge and information. And then to this question about 
um, AI more generally, they're also walking in with a co-pilot, you know, whether it's uh, Dr. Google or Dr. ChatGPT uh, or a ChatGPT trained on medical materials, uh, or even, you know, in a very literal sense, ChatGPT when it comes to academic papers, they're, they're coming in with a co-pilot who can um, synthesize that information. And so, but I, what I hear you saying is the job of the school and, uh, um, the healthcare provider is to add some value on top of that to create a different kind of experience that synthesizes beyond simply what we can get out of the, um, you know, out of the data we carry around. And maybe to your point, lean into it, embrace the fact that people are much more knowledgeable. So bringing these two ideas together for a second, uh, your role at uh, University of California is to think about data as strategy. Um, so given this changing world, given that people have a lot more data, given that they are much more facile with that data, um, how are you thinking about the data strategy inside UCI? Uh, um, you know, is it just, you know, dashboards and, uh, reports, or hopefully we're doing more than that. Yeah. So I think it, it's, it's a couple of, couple of things I would point to, uh, you know, so one is, is I would say the, the, the main strategies have started with kind of patient at the center in the healthcare enterprise and student at the center in terms of building that that's who we're here for. And so let's build our data strategies around making sure that those two populations, those two core stakeholders or customers, I, I like to call them customers, um, have successful outcomes, whatever defining assessiveness outcome is. Uh, and so then it's like, so, and now what is the universe of data that we're generating and that we've generated previously around this? Where is new technology kind of in flight that's going to bring us new data or higher quality data? And how do we think about like aggregating it together? Right. And so you got to act, you know, you got to pull it together, but then you have to give it format and structure and governance around it, like build that foundation. And then we can start to create you know, that analytical layer on top of it that, that then helps people make data informed decisions. That could be if, if I take the student as an example. Okay, so that so that means the admissions, the advisors, um, even the individual professors that they're working with, they now we can now give them information for data informed decisions. In the classroom, that might be the context of, okay, um this year's, you know, this year's course that I'm teaching, the the you know, the my seeing 50 students, but I noticed that everyone really did bad on this one, you know, this one aspect of, of the, the exam. Why? And then you go back into, let's talk about, let's look at the assignments we gave them. Let's look at the students engaged in the assignments. Did they watch the videos? How many of them were, were wound the videos and actually watched the second, third, fourth time? It's like that data now exists so that the professor can self-examine their approach to things. And so like, so how do you then give them those tools? And so we've done a lot around what we call like the holistic and uh, longitudinal understanding of the learner, meaning from the time that they first express interest in coming to UC Irvine to the time they leave us and start into their career, we are we have mapped out what is all the data that we're generating, how have we brought it all together, and kind of building a personalized understanding, like a one to n equals one understanding of that student, and then personalizing how each person who's helping them get to those goals can, can work with them. And so that's kind of how we're doing it in the student, in, in the student realm. There's a similar story about how we're doing it in the patient realm, but there's a second part to your question that you asked, which is how is that going to change? Cause, cause you know, the analytics world is changing and I'll, and I'll use this example, free generative AI, most of healthcare organizations, their analytical strategy was based around 5% data that was in structured form. And then figured out how to take all these semi and unstructured data, use natural language processing approaches and figure out how to pull that stuff out and put it into structured form. So it could be part of the analytical framework. That's what we're doing. Now, all of a sudden you get this thing called generative AI tool, GPT. And now you can take all that unstructured data and now include it into your analytical framework and your way of thinking. So it went from 5% to 100% almost overnight. Now you had to think about how do I build an architecture to support structured and unstructured continuously? How do I query it? How do you bring back the results around it? So it changed your whole strategy in terms of at the data layer. 
But what we're only now starting to realize is not only is it changing kind of the data architecture layer, but at the analytical layer, the concept of building dashboards is going to go away. If you've played with these tools now and they have to become more multimodal, if I could use that term, it's going to be a query based analytical world, which is tell me, you know, how many patients in my cohort that I'm responsible for do I have on a GLP 1? drug, approved drug. How many patients, and, you know, and I'm going to say that in, in a language, my, my core language as a prompting, and it's going to build me a graph and a narrative that is then going to be part of the report that I, that I make. And it's not going to be specialists building dashboards for you and how do you want the filters to work. It's going to be every person is going to have the ability to speak to an agent an AI agent, and it's going to generate the analytics. And they go, no, 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 no. What I really meant was, you know, I wanted to understand the distribution by socio socioeconomic group or ethnic group within the population of, of, of patients that I'm responsible for. And then the engine goes and recalculates that. Um, and so, you know, this concept of it's not just a synthesizer, but it's actually a conversational colleague is where we're going. And I don't need these specialized skills of how to build dashboards or how to even operate dashboards. I just need to tell it where I wanted to do. We're trying to get our analytical frameworks ready to support that world, which is kind of coming, you know, we're coming at it so fast. The question is, is who's going to be able to enable that first? And we actually showed some of our end users, like what that world might look like, like interact with the data. Ask your question in the prompt window. Look what's going to generate for you. And people are like, whoa, I didn't think we, we could do that with these tools. It's not perfect, but whoa, I didn't have to go talk to IT about building me a dashboard. I just asked this tool to build me a dashboard. Have we bought it yet? Because I'd really like to start using this tool tomorrow. That's the world that's coming at us at such a fast pace that we're not ready for it yet. But the ones that are ready for it are going to gain advantage. So one of the common themes we've heard on this podcast is um, leaders, data leaders talking about creating data teams, which are really business partners. They understand the strategy of the organization. When they get asked a question like, you know, how many of my patients are on a, a particular drug? They also know uh, to uh, push back and question um, and meaning to, uh, to think about the data context that they have, and then also challenge the questioner with what's the correct question to be asking about this data. Um, and in that sense, I think uh, we really have an opportunity with these AI strategies where we're not just automating uh, the dashboard production, but we're automating the data analyst because a good data analyst is, a, is kind of a partner in crime. They're the one who thinks analytically, they think statistically as, you know, someone whose undergrad was in math and statistics, I, you know, I like to think about these questions from that perspective. And if we could actually take that skill set, put it very close to the data, uh, it starts to really open opportunity about what data you collect, but also how you interpret results that come back. Um, you know, even some simple things like saying, well, there's, you know, the, um, the results for this group are better than that group. Is it better enough? Well, how much better? Is it better beyond uh, one or two standard deviations? How do I measure that? And these are the kinds of things that a good analyst would would push back on and say, yeah, this is different, but it's not different enough and those sorts of things. I don't know. Does that resonate? It does. You know, I think, you know, the, you know, the generic data analyst has a value in the equation. And then if you have a, a data, a health data analyst or a health informaticist, right? They're more valuable because they understand the context of the data, right? They understand that the lab value is within a reasonable value or it's outside the norms. That actually makes it more value in this equation. That you're talking about. You know, I had some, I'll just call it a conversation about the future with a colleague of mine at another organization. And we were talking about whether your, your, your data analysts, the people who are interfacing with your business, your, your business partners, if they need to become expert prompters, because is, is the key of, of the successful data analyst helping your business partner prompt in the most, in the best way to bring out the insight that they're trying to get the answer to. And it was a really intriguing point that he made to me. Cause I was like, 
I understand the power of good prompting in, in terms of, you know, just doing it, doing it well and being really, really good at it. And it's really interesting to think uh, that, that we might be looking at a time now where we need to retool our, our data teams into being the organization's expert prompters to help our business users get what they need faster. It's an intriguing question that I haven't wrestled completely to the ground myself, but this is kind of like where the front edge of innovation is happening around data now. Yeah, and I, I guess to add a perspective to that, in some ways, I think the, the degree to which we spend so much energy thinking about prompts is probably a failure of the system uh, more than uh, uh, it shouldn't be the goal of the system. Uh, it should be the case that you can ask intelligent questions. It could push back it go, it, to your point about entering into a dialogue um, where th through intelligent interaction, uh, it's guiding you to ask the right questions, get the correct answers. Now, all of this is predicated uh, on the underlying data. And so I wonder where we sort of began the conversation and talk a little bit about the data. And my limited experience with educational institutions is that they are absolutely the worst when it comes to data, in particular data silos, uh, that they are often organized by department, by school, uh, it could be split by a university and a healthcare provider, uh, and they think about their world in a very insular way, and as a result, often create uh, really tall data silos that are very hard to break down. And, and obviously your role sits across all of those, and as we've talked about your strategy, uh, for the uh, institution that's really thinking about data as a primary driver for that strategy. Uh, how do you think about breaking down these data silos, thinking about the quality of the underlying data, um, finding new insights when you look across? Uh, it must be a tremendous challenge. Uh, it's definitely a challenge. I don't know if education is the worst, but it's challenging for sure. You, you are not wrong in your statements about the data silos. And, you know, this is one, it was one of the reasons why we had the foresight to put kind of data in the title, right? It was just like, someone has to be responsible for data, right? Data silos means that you have data owners who want to hook their data, right? They, you have, you have a lot of, the silos are really data huggers. And so the question is, it's like, who tries to get the data huggers to release their data for broader institutional use? Well, that's kind of part of my role, right? And so that means things like data governance is something that I'm responsible for setting up and coordinating and trying to operationalize and, you know, and have effective governance uh, versus ineffective governance, which is another thing that educational institutions are really, really good at. Uh, so, so governance is something I work on. And of course, that we're talking really about humans, change management, you know, and those types of things. It is one of those things that, you know, my role, my, my role, the level of my role allows me to be a strong convener of people to push against the status quo of data silos and, well, these are our students, you know, in our school of X and to say, look, it's an institutional asset. The data that's here is an institutional asset. You don't own, it. you know, there's aspects of it that the student owns their data and we need to give them agency of their data, right? But it's the institution's asset, not your school of business or your school of engineering to pick on the two of them. And so my job is to kind of break down those silos so that we build institutional views, partially so we can look at the differences in the cohorts that maybe are out of school or out of departments or in STEM fields versus non-STEM fields, or students that are on Pell Grants versus, you know, uh, students that paid full fare. So my job is to create an institutional data asset, which is an institutional strategy for how we manage, curate, and make available our data. So it, it absolutely is a challenge, but um, I think the challenge is that every organization, it just might be a little bit uh, more intense and a little bit more challenging here because of the nature of local school and department autonomy. Yeah, so I mean, this very much speaks to, uh, I have my uh, ongoing effort to uh, get people to talk about Dayton's law uh, for data. Uh, if you've heard of Conway's law, Conway's law says that the software that a software company produces is a is a reflection of the organizational structure that they or how they organize to generate that software. Uh, so Dayton's law is the same thing applied to data, uh, that the data that an organization collects will reflect the organizational structure uh, of uh, that they've chosen to organize by. So in academic institutions, organizing by school, for example, 
creates this behavior of my students versus your students, it means that you tend to, in using your example, organize your or collect the data about students for a given school. And therefore, the probability that you have students that cross schools that are not being found um, goes up. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I would say, like in, like in our institution, um, behavior is stronger in the graduate student population mm-hmm. than the undergraduate, right? Where we have one process for all undergraduate students who come to us. You know, and this is where, you know, you need someone who can kind of identify that and raise a conversation because you can change. And certainly you can, you may not have to change your organizational structure, but you can change the data flows in such a way that that is no longer propagated in, by your structure. And I would say that we've had situations where my role has kind of been the instigator and the driver of that. Uh, and, you know, as well as sometimes it comes back to they lead us to see that we've enacted policies that just don't make sense in this kind of data informed world. And we have to have a conversation about how do we go change that policy at the institution because it's actually holding our students back from the outcomes that we want to see more of. And so this is where data is, you know, it's sometimes you're using it in a very operational setting and sometimes you're stepping back and saying we have a structural barrier that we've created at the institution that we need to challenge about whether it, it is aligned with, you know, the values that we have as an institution. And there have been cases where we've had that conversation. The reality has been working with our faculty in one example. They're like, you're right. This doesn't make sense. There was a time when we made that policy that we thought it made sense. Today, looking at it, it doesn't make sense. We can change the policy. And that's a big thing in education. Right? For the Senate, the academic Senate to come back and say, we're willing to change a policy if there's something we've set in place, that's a big deal, right? Data drove the conversation for us, which is exactly one of the uses that data can play. Yeah, and I love that. This idea of anchoring it on the strategy. We want to create this outcome for the, for the uh, student. We can't create that outcome because the data is trapped in silos. Why is it trapped in silos? Because that's the policy we've created. The Dayton's law says we've organized it this way, and that way we're going to create this outcome. Great. Now let's change the policy and, and create the outcome for the, in this case, the, the student by looking at the data in a fresh way, cutting across that silo. Uh, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I know, uh, for, for folks that are listening, uh, if these topics are interesting, Tom, I know you also have a podcast of your own called digital squared. Um, so maybe if, for folks that are interested, maybe share a little bit about the podcast. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to plug. So Digital Square, light in an increasingly digital world is the tagline. And the whole idea is, is that our lives are really putting, being more and more put in a digital form, right? There was a time when the only way we could have done this podcast, you and I, is if I traveled to you or you traveled to me and we sat in a room for, and then we would, you know, we would capture it. Now we're able to use it over technology, which means we have files that we can compute against. We could correct things that were said wrong, take out the imperfections and all of that. Well, think about all the places where we now have, you know, digital technologies enabling things. Computer vision is a great one, right? Computer vision, uh, you know, looking at the retinal, uh, retinal nerve finding diseases, uh, you know, within it, right? Uh, Kind of championed by Google. So what we try to do in the podcast is bring innovators who are doing interesting things, taking advantage of digital movement and have them talk about how they got there, how they're pushing the boundaries of whatever their domain is, and where do we think things are going next. And, you know, of course, AI is a a huge part of that, but we have to think about there's lots of other technologies. Uh, The concept of immersive experiences and digital twins are huge movements of technology that are changing industries even faster than AI in in some respect. So we bring a wide variety of, of thought leaders from different industries. They cover healthcare. They cover, cover education, but we'll also bring people from, you know, the, the venture community who are working with startups and what does an AI at the center startup look like today and how are they different from the companies used to fund in the past? So we bring a variety of, of speakers on there just to talk about how fast our world is changing and how exponential it really looks when you step back and look at how fast it's changing. Oh, super cool. I'm sure uh, folks would really enjoy that. I've really appreciated you sharing uh, what you see Irvine's doing, uh, how you're thinking about the overall strategy where education and healthcare is going over the next five or 10 years, but more importantly, how to connect that back to 
uh, the data strategy and thinking about really how to enable and empower people with that data uh, to actually take advantage of that change and to be ahead of it uh, as opposed to being impacted by it. So Tom, uh, thanks a ton for joining us on Data Masters. Anthony, thank you for the opportunity. Love the conversation. Thanks for joining us for the latest episode of the Data Masters podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to any resources mentioned on today's show. And if you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe so you never miss an episode. Experience Tamer's proven data-centric AI, engineered to speed the discovery, enrichment, and maintenance of the golden records businesses need to accelerate growth. Tamer's expertise in quickly and accurately unifying large amounts of data across disparate sources gets results faster at a lower cost compared to traditional master data management or DIY solutions. Stop wasting time on bad data. Visit www.tamer.com. That's T-A-M-R.com to see results now.